<laughs> Hello. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Is this thing working? OK, that's good. My piece of paper says 7 o'clock start, so that's what we'll do. Um, uh, the, there are some routine housekeeping matters to deal with before we start. It's the usual stuff. And we're not expecting to be alarmed, but if there is an alarm, don't immediately be alarmed because it might not be serious. However, the security guards will find out whether it's serious and then tell us what to do. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, the nearest toilets are down the stairs, and if you need to have a drink during the event, there is a water dispenser outside as well. And I'm going to have some water now. Right, who am I and why am I here? <clears throat> My name's Dave Hill. I've lived in Hackney uh, since uh, 1983, I think it is. Uh, and uh, until quite recently, I, I, I'm a journalist, and until quite recently, I wrote a column about London for The Guardian. That was terminated at the end of January for two reasons. One is that they are stupid, and the second reason is that they are skinned. Uh, but I've carried on writing about London, uh, including about Hackney. I've got a, uh, I now uh, publish a website called onlondon.co.uk, and I also, in my spare time, do a little blog called the Clapton Pond blog, which is about things going on in my little bit of Hackney. Um, so, uh, uh, I, I've been asked to do this because they seem to think I know what I'm talking about. So let me explain the format for the evening. It's a bit, a bit like what you see on the telly with David Dimbleby. Uh, we've got a list of submitted questions, uh, and in most cases, the person who put the question through is here. In some cases, I gather they are not, so I will probably ask the questions for them. We'll try and get a nice, clear answer from Phil, and then we'll throw it open to the questioner, if they're not satisfied perhaps with the answer that they got, and anybody else who's interested in that particular issue who wants to, uh, to, to, to throw in their, 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 their few pennies worth as well. Um, I want to uh, you know, encourage patience and politeness. So a lot of the issues, in fact all the issues we're going to talk about are very important. People feel very passionately about them, and rightly so, but we want to get more light than heat. So I ask you, if you can, to keep your questions and your comments from the floor nice and short and sharp and clear and to the point. Be polite. I'll make sure that he answers them properly. And if you're not satisfied, you can, you can come back again. But we also want to illuminate these issues. Some of them are quite complicated for everybody in the room. If we can do that, that would be good. Not go on for too long. Um, there will be questions submitted on Twitter during the night. And depending on how things proceed, we might get onto some of those. But if we don't get onto any of those, uh, the mayor is going to be answering questions submitted via Twitter tomorrow morning. Uh, now, this event is being filmed and streamed live on the council's Facebook page, and it will be uploaded onto the council's YouTube page for people to watch tomorrow, tomorrow and so that my children can have a good laugh at me. And um, the last and very important point is that officers from the council uh, will be around afterwards. Now, if there are any points that you raise during the meeting which are kind of very detailed, or there are things that uh, you didn't want to talk about or didn't have the chance to talk about uh, during the meeting, but, but, but you would like, like someone to look into for you, you can approach those officers at the end, and they sincerely promise that they will uh, look into your concerns for you. So that's a very important bit to do at the end. So now I'm going to ask the Mayor, Philip Glanville, to just explain why he's doing this. Uh, thank you, Dave, and thank you, everyone, for coming uh, this evening. When I was running for election last year, uh, one of the key things for me was opening up uh, the Town Hall and the political leadership to new forms of engagement. Uh, tonight's event, the Question Time, is only a part of that effort and it's going to be the only one that we have until the election next year. So we get a chance to look at whether it works as a format, uh, whether residents enjoy it, opening up on social media and filming was really important. But it becomes part of a suite of things. So I introduced a monthly advice surgery for casework type issues so that people could come and see me face to face. I've been doing Meet the Mayor and former events across the borough, some in Finsbury Park, De Beauvoir, other places. So if any of you come from community organisations, or estates, or faith groups, or anyone else that would like me to come and do a more targeted local version of this. That's something that I've been very interested in doing uh, and have done a number of over the year. 
I'm also opening myself up to formal question time from my councillor colleagues twice a year, as well as the types of things that happen around full council uh, and cabinet meetings. So for me, it's opening up that dialogue and access to me uh, and my colleagues. The council more broadly, I think, is trying to open up the way it engages. So we had big borough-wide conversation that I think Dave was part of in terms of having a place for everyone. Last year we did a piece of work around schools and what type of education policy people wanted from the borough. And this year already, or we will be doing, we've had conversations about the Britannia Leisure Centre, community strategy, the local plan and housing strategy, all of which have an outreach element. So this really sits in that broader range of ways of hopefully engaging with Hackney residents and making sure that they feel that when we're making decisions in this room and rooms like it, that your voice is heard. Okay, thanks very much. Now we'll get on to the first question. Now I'm told that we are short of a microphone, possibly. So uh, the, the, the golden rule is when you finish using it, give it back to the person who gave it to you so that it can be moved on quickly to the next person. I'm also told that the, the person who was going to ask the very first question may or may not be here. So I'm just going to check that James McDade, is James McDade here or not? Not here. Okay, so I'm going to ask his question for him because I've got it written down here, okay? And it's about the mayor's priorities, so a very general opening question, really. And James's question is, what are the three areas that the mayor would like to invest council resources and finances into over his four-year tenure as mayor? And what time frame is he setting for delivering them? And what does he hope to achieve? A, a big question, Dave. Okay. Um, so I've been mayor for a year, uh, and I've primarily focused on three things that I wanted to do before next year's elections. And the most critical one for me was answering the question, do the growth and change opportunities that are happening here in Hackney work for everyone? In our survey last, uh, uh, in 2015, lots of residents said that those opportunities did not work for them, that they felt excluded from regeneration, excluded from the jobs and opportunities that were being created in this borough. And we'd done some work on that, but we obviously hadn't done a good enough job. So critical to me was changing how all of our services that do that type of work uh, operate. So in terms of council recruitment and apprenticeships, creating 100 apprenticeships from this council, uh, solely directed towards people from this borough to come and work for us and get that best start in life uh, and the skills of working for the council and making sure that, that goes to local people. The Hackney 100 programme, uh, which is paid work experience, coordinated by the council, with some of those employers coming to the borough, making sure people that wanted to get into industries like creative, tech, uh, architecture, hospitality, had the best possible start uh, to doing that. Hackney Works is the new name for Ways Into Work, which had been the council's job brokerage. That used to have a very narrow focus on people just out of work and furthest from the labour market. It now has a bigger focus on those that are underemployed and not earning enough, so those that are in, in work poverty. Again, people that have been feeding back that they felt excluded from the borough's change. So a lot of work on that. Champion adult learning, ESOL, and some of those other things. So that all of that area around skills and work. The other key thing was continuing our development of new housing in the borough and building to a point where hopefully in the next four years we can see a doubling of the council's output of council homes uh, and eventually London living rent as well. We've seen some of those going into planning. We've got our first 100% genuinely affordable schemes coming forward in Clapton Park, building on our record of housing delivery. And finally, it's thinking about those big, sometimes controversial decisions that will, will uh, improve the borough for a generation. So that is making investment decisions around leisure centres and schools. It's thinking about what needs to happen in terms of our libraries, thinking about income generation for the council in the long term, uh, thinking about sustainability in terms of energy uh, and energy companies, and making sure all of our buildings like this one are, are fit for the next generation. So it's those three things that I think I've able to sort of set the train uh, in, in focus in this year okay. and it'll be going on into next year. All right, so growth for everyone, that theme that we talked about before, housing, you know, the big issue across the whole city really, and investing for the future, so thinking ahead, right? So those are the sort of three things, very, very simply put. There's a lot of detail there. I don't know whether the person who knew about James, do you want to come back on any of that or do you want to follow that up? You're happy, okay. Okay, now, okay, thank you. 
Anybody else want to come back on any of those particular points? Don't be shy. Okay, I saw the first hand was over there, and I'll come to you in a moment. Yes, microphone over there, please. Hold, hold on just a second. We've got the, there we go. Thank we you. can all hear you. Thank you. Um, you mentioned genuinely affordable housing. What is that? It's a good question. So uh, we commonly, as a council and housing campaigners and housing experts, define it as not spending more than a third of your income on housing costs. So people that are privately renting in this borough are already spending upwards of 50 to 60% of their income uh, on rental costs. And you had a government bringing in a new form of affordable housing that the council doesn't really have a great deal of control over, which was 80% of market rent, which had no link to people's incomes, no link to their ability to pay. So when I say genuinely affordable, I'm in council rented homes that the council is building on council rents and on council tenancies. And that's what the council directly builds. I've also talked about London living rent, which is seeing a, a type of private rented housing that has that cap, has that third of income cap. So you take a look at average incomes in parts of the borough, and it's based on Sadiq Khan's model, and you say, this is the average income in that area. It, it, people can't afford more than a third of their income on rent, and then you base a rent on that. And that is basically coming out at a two-bedroom property for £1,000 a month, which is approximately half what the private rental market is offering. So trying to keep those people uh, in the borough that are finding private renting uh, really difficult. And in terms of home ownership, it's shared ownership that, again, wouldn't cost more than a third of someone's income to purchase a share of uh, and put their first step on the ladder. And that's what I hope we are going to be delivering and already deliver in terms of our affordable housing. What the market and what housing associations do, we have limited control over uh, with our planning powers. Uh, and that's where you get those things where you see affordable homes that aren't affordable for local people in that debate. Could I just come in? I mean, it's, it's, uh, if I can just sort of slightly elaborate on, on, on part of your question. The, my sense is, is that uh, people get very agitated about this word affordable and what it really means and is it really affordable and so on. But is it true, would you say, in Hackney, that the... Uh, the uh, affordability problem has sort of spread up through the income range to some extent. So you might have said 15, 20 years ago that, that it was people with very low incomes uh, who were in need of affordable housing, but there's a sense that people on slightly higher incomes are also in need of some sort of help. And another form of affordable housing, which wouldn't be affordable to people who might qualify for social rent, but... but, it, but uh, if you're a young person born and raised in Hackney in the mid-twenties, got a medium-sized sort of job, income, you can't afford to buy anywhere. You've got to, have you as a, as a, a leader of a, of, a, of a big council got to think about those people as well now? I think uh, absolutely as Dave has sort of set out, you've got people that desperately need council housing. There's 13,000 families and individuals on our waiting list desperately in need of council housing. We must build more council housing. But then you've got everybody that's already excluded from council housing because of income. They're living with parents. They're living with friends. They're living in shared housing. We must have an answer to that. The private market is not going to provide an answer to that uh, in Hackney at a price people can afford. Okay. And all of that uncertainty you get in the private rented sector as well. So where people are just about holding on, uh, and paying those high rents. They're at risk of rent rises. They're at risk of the fees that people pay to, it, uh, to, to take on those properties and to exit those properties. And they've got all of the uncertainty that brings. Okay. And woe betalk befall anyone that's in that situation that gets ill health or faces family breakdown because they have none of the protections that a properly regulated housing market okay. would provide. Can I go back to the question and say, do you, do, what do you think of that answer? Are you happy with the idea that people who might be earning a sort of average kind of income, who are young and don't have, and are perhaps renting privately, should be getting uh, help with affordable housing? Thanks, Gareth. Well, yes, I do. I do think yep. so. I, the, the problem is, is that I, I think we really don't know what is affordable anymore. I mean, some people are earning in the NHS not particularly high salaries, which mean that they are still living with their parents. I'm speaking of my son. Um, yeah. I don't want, 
and my son probably doesn't want to be living with me, but he has no option. And I think there's a lot of people caught in that, in that problem, okay. in, in Hackney particularly. Thank you. Before I come on to the other questions, does anybody else want to pick up on any of those points about housing? Yes, sir. Um, it's just, just hold on for a second for the microphone, please. There you go. Um, it's encouraging to hear that, I mean, but I would like, you know, which is something which is very near to my heart, is families having the ability to live in still in inner London. Um, what part would that pay for where we need larger family housing? How would that fit into your into your picture of affordable housing and if you can give some sort of an idea what Thanks. part would it be paid because it we all know that it when 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 any development it only really becomes it becomes when you're talking rather one one bedroom units are viable two really a question anything above that okay is not viable at all let's get an answer from the mayor it's getting harder and harder to deliver affordable family housing in london and especially in inner London. So that trade-off between the number of units and the size of those units we're sort of seeing playing out uh, when we do development. We're very clear in our planning policy and in our own estate regeneration that we want a third of the homes built in Hackney to be of family size. So that's three beds or more. Uh, at, but there are trade-offs sometimes and there are trade-offs on estates. When we've done estate regeneration, when we're doing estate infill, we look at the local housing need and making sure that if people, if the housing need on those estates are actually people caught by the bedroom tax that need to downsize, then we need to deliver a proportion of smaller units, as well as those family units, which is the boa kind of wide need. Uh, in Stamford Hill, we're doing a development at Tower Court, and there are, are very large family homes there of four or five uh, bedrooms that we're prioritizing there, given the housing need in that, uh, that local area. But those sort of sites come up few and far between. So we have, to, we have to look at a mixture, um, but we've been very clear that we do need that family housing and we can't just see it all going to one and two bedrooms and we put that steer out to the private market as well. The challenge is when those larger homes are built by private developers is they're very, very expensive and they often get subdivided into flat shares and professional okay. sharers okay. and we don't have any control over that at the moment. Right, okay, so there's a limit to what, what you as a as an authority can, can how to, to which you can influence what goes on. Just very quickly, any more points before I come to you? I haven't forgotten you, uh, just on the housing thing. Do you want a quick question? Thank you. Uh, my name's Julianne Richards, and I'm here as a member of the Hackney Green Party. Um, and I, I completely agree that affordable housing is super important, but so is safe housing. And one of the things that we've been calling for is for sprinklers to be installed in all of the tower blocks in Hackney. Yeah. That seems to be taking a terribly long time. Sprinklers could be in a position to save lives, as we've sadly seen. So I'd like to get an answer on when Good. we'll see sprinklers installed okay. in all of the tower blocks in Hackney. Yep. Yeah, go on, Phil. So I think we've been very clear of our position on sprinklers. Uh, whether it's the outcome of the Grenfell inquiry, the interim report, or recommendations, from our independent fire or the London Fire Brigade, we will install sprinklers in those blocks. We have 70 uh, blocks over, over 10 storeys. We have three above 20 storeys and 181 above six storeys. In order to prioritise that work, we've got to focus on not just height, but design and layout and looking at where we install those sprinklers uh, and making sure that if we are recommended in doing it, that we do it in the right way. I have to say, when you talk to residents, there are a large number that do want sprinklers installed, but there are a lot that are quite sceptical about the impact uh, on their homes and what type of design, what type of disruption. So I think if we're to take people forward and make that installation, we need those very clear recommendations from, from experts, and then we will take that action. We've definitely said we will do it, uh, but we will wait for the outcomes of probably the interim stage of the Grenfell inquiry. Clearly, the London Fire Brigade have moved on that issue only in the last month. They've made some recommendations that we're looking at locally and we'll roll out a programme uh, when we need to. What we also have to admit, though, is it will be very costly. I think we can find those resources locally and we would find them uh, if, if the movement was towards sprinklers. But that would mean, unless the government puts some serious money into this, uh, either in forms of flexible loans uh, or further investment, then we'd have to stop doing other things. And I think the borough needs to be involved in that discussion as well. Okay, great. Now, I'm, you've been waiting very patiently, so I'm going to bring you in there. It's okay. Thank you. you. Have to have a choice on this, because this actually is either about housing or 
You, want to, you need to speak into Sorry, the mic. Or I can it. ask about apprenticeships. I live in an area in N4 which is under attack, I think. We've met before, we've talked about these issues. Housing. Who are you legally responsible to house? I live in an area that has an incredible density of hostels, of which unfortunately have been appallingly managed which have had terrible detriment in terms of violence, drug dealing, knife attacks, actually have had a murder. I mean, the list carries on daily. Okay. Hackney seem to have answered that you have a responsibility to house. I'd be very clear about this. I'll be very on PC about this. Mm. We have a hostel that is riddled with junkies and addicts and dealers. Okay. okay? So Come so to your question. How do because what responsibility do you have to house? And then when things go wrong, what responsibility do you have, obviously council, not you personally, to amend this situation? Okay. I'm being very polite and very brief because I could go on. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I think I think without getting into the specifics of, of the area, because we there's other places to have that uh, uh, debate, I think we have a duty to house those that we have a responsibility for under the Housing Act, uh, and that's that 13,000 that we have on the council's waiting list. Blame the Housing Act. So we, responsibility, responsibility to who? we have a responsibility to a lot of those people that you're talking about. So people can commit, people can commit antisocial behaviour. They can be evicted from properties, and there are there are exclusions if people make themselves intentionally homeless, if they've committed certain types of crime. But by and large. Okay. If there are children involved, if there are young adults involved, or there's been family breakdown, we rightly have a housing duty to some of the most vulnerable uh, in society, and we should meet that housing duty. And we've worked very hard over the last seven years, we've seen a tripling of the numbers of families in temporary accommodation in this borough, which leads to more hostels, which leads to people in smaller and smaller places. The blame for that rests f firmly with this Conservative government that constantly hasn't invested in enough social housing. They haven't invested properly through the welfare system and they've exacerbated homelessness through that welfare system. And then they're leaving communities and councils like okay. Hackney to pick up the pieces. Well, let's, you, you shook your head when Phil blamed the Conservatives. But what would you, but what, but what would you, what, what, hold on a sec. What would, you, what would you like him to do? If you can be very brief about it, what would you like him to do that he okay, isn't I, doing? Okay, I'm quite clear about this. I have a particular personal belief that we do have responsibility, responsibility to house vulnerable because it can happen to any one of us at any given time. Okay. So saying that, when you open a hostel and you house known addicts, known people that have vulnerability and behavioral problems, and you do not manage it, of which the consequences okay. are so negative, very well recorded, right. our police involved, social services are So involved. are you saying you just feel that the standard of care isn't high I'm enough? curious Is about it? at what point it becomes your responsibility to actually rectify the situation. If you, are go if you have the responsibility, which I believe you should, you also have the responsibility to house them and other hostile users safely okay, that, that, and that, for that's, residents. That's None so of this has happened. I started this let's in have, February let's, with you. let's have a quick answer, and we need to move on to some I other I think questions. at Wilberforce Road, we got it completely wrong. We took over a hostel. Normally, when we take over a hostel, we improve both standards to the community and standards to those residents. We were too slow to act to the, the, the inquiries from the community. Uh, it, it, we have acted during those <coughs> nine months very clearly, though. We've moved on people from... Uh, that hostel in recent weeks. We've installed CCTV, we've installed okay. uh, security guard. The, if the council, if the council, if the council... Okay, okay, let, 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 him, let him answer his question, then we've it, got to move on to some other... To, to some I, I firmly believe that the council taking an entire building lease or the council taking on management is far better than the situation where you still have in some hostels in the borough where you've got multiple councils essentially dumping people here without that support and without that advice. Okay. So Hackney's approach has always been 
You need to make sure that that advice and support is in place. Here at Wilberforce Road, we got the management wrong, we got the advice and support wrong, and we got the people that we placed there wrong uh, as well, and then we didn't act quickly enough to put it right. Okay, I think we've learned a lot from that experience, and we have acted to put it right since. Right. Okay, thank, thanks. Though. Okay, let's, let's stop it there. So let's take, note, let's take note of that. You've got that on the record, and we can go. Pat, if you can hold on just a second, I want to ask if on those three big points that we had right at the beginning of the answer to this first question, that we've talked a lot about housing. Um, there's also this question of people feeling excluded from the way that Hackney has changed and, and grown. And the, and the third point was about investing for the future. I imagine you're anticipating continuing population growth, demand for schools and leisure facilities and so on. Now, does anybody want to quickly raise a point on either of those two issues? Yes, please. And then we must get on to question two. Hi, my name's Alexia. I'm here on behalf of the Women's Equality Party, Hackney. The um, Women's Equality Party, sorry. Yes, sorry. Women's Equality Party. Right, um, right. I'd like to ask a question about your employment agenda. It sounds very positive. Um, given the national and borough-wide gender pay gap, I wonder how you plan in your policy specifically to ensure that women are paid equally for the same work as men. Well, uh, all of, all of the council's contracts uh, and employment work is based fundamentally around getting people onto jobs that at least pay the London uh, living wage. In terms of the paid work experience and the apprenticeship programmes, we're doing very detailed equality monitoring of those programmes to ensure that we reach those that are hard to reach, whether that be care leavers, whether it be having the gender balance, whether it means that the workforce reflects the demography uh, of the borough, and also encouraging people from underrepresented groups into industries like tech. You know, tech is a very male-dominated industry. They're high-paying jobs. Women are often excluded from that, either from uh, school or just the aspiration hasn't been solved or they can't break into those networks. And I know that my cabinet lead, Councillor Williams, is very keen to make sure that STEM is encouraged in school uh, and that we actually make sure that those apprenticeships and those work experience go to those people and that we break down some of those barriers of entry into those uh, industries. I think across the board we also know that a lot of the lowest paid people are women. So we've moved a lot of people from unemployment into paid work, but they're still in poverty. And that's why that expanded ways into work service is so important. So it's not seeing people on zero hours contracts and, and things that people are supported to move okay. on up. Would you, would you say that the, the, the particular questions about gender gaps, pay gaps and opportunity gaps, is that, do you see addressing that particular issue as part of the, the good and better growth of this borough in the future? Absolutely. Okay. The people I meet most are pe women working all hours of the day and night to support their families, but are being uh, under-renumerated because they're in low-paid work. If we can move more people uh, from that situation by upskilling them, if they're working for the council, using the apprenticeship levy to upskill them if they're working for us, and if they're working for external organisations, creating that infrastructure in the borough around training and skills and ESOL and other things that will allow them to progress out of that work. It's okay. no right, sorry, Phil, but... Does that, is that a satisfactory answer to be going on with? And you can hold him up to the mark. Yes, and we look forward to the results. Good, OK. Now, we've had, we've had 20 minutes on that first question, which is fine because it was a very broad question, but we need to steam ahead to question two, which is about the Britannia Leisure Centre, a much more specific issue. And I know the person... Could, hold on. Well, I've, I've, well, no, no, well I, I asked for general questions on housing, and we got a couple. We've now got to get on to, we've now got to go into other questions. This is the issue you particularly wanted to talk about, I think. So I'm asking your friend, your colleague, Jill, if she would like to ask her question. Jill. Thanks. My name's Jill Small. I'm mm. not representing anyone except myself. Um, I work in the tech industry, quite by accident, given my age. Um, and it's brutal on women. I can, I can confirm that. And mm -hmm. so any initiative... Can, can you get on with your question, Anyway, please? in you. light of um, the Britannia Leisure Centre, some of these big questions, controversial questions. In light of Brexit, uh, together with society's recent acknowledgement of the social and environmental dangers of high-rise towers, plus Hackney's own statistics showing little to no growth in demand for secondary school places in South Hackney. Here's a loaded question. What's the financial, social, 
an environmental benefit for the Hackney, to Hackney of the Britannia Leisure Centre redevelopment. Okay, so put very simply, you want to knock this, oh, this, this Britannia Leisure Centre down, which I used years ago, and you want to put up some other stuff, and you obviously think that what you're going to replace it with Luxury is better, tower flats better, for hold on, overseas, better for the borough uh, than what's, better for the the borough than what's being knocked down. So justify your position to, to your I questioner. Have, so that's part one. He's going to answer now. Okay. So I, Britannia Leisure Centre is a leisure centre that's reaching the end of its life. It was built between 35 and 40 years ago in the south of the borough. Investing in its future would, would, if you were to just refurbish the existing leisure centre, would cost £17 million and lead to closure for 18 months. That's unacceptable to deprive a community of a leisure centre for that long and it would only be a stopgap measure. It wouldn't address any of the fundamental issues with the design uh, of the leisure centre. We also do have a deficit of school places uh, in the borough, and I said on the opening, we don't get the fully fund, full funding to provide those school places. We need about 1,600 extra by 2021. So we've looked at where those school places can go. One site is in the north of the borough, one site's in the south of the borough, and we made the decision to explore whether or not we could rebuild Britannia Leisure Centre and, re and introduce those school places. The only way to fund those things, in the absence of external resources, is to build private housing. And we've had that dialogue with that, that, that community there in Shoreditch. And by and large, the community supported our approach during the consultation uh, and, and engagement. But they did say some fundamental other things. They said they wanted to see affordable housing on site. So we've introduced affordable housing uh, on site. It's just under 20% of the development, which is far below the 50% that we would aim for elsewhere. The reason for that is because we have to build the leisure centre and the school. They said they wanted to have that fun family fun uh, kind of approach within the leisure centre that they have at the moment. So at Britannia, you've got a uh, flume, you've got a wave machine, you've got kind of paddling space, a beach area. They value those things as well as lane swimming. So the new Britannia that we're, const we're going out and talking to residents about has those elements and lane swimming. So it'll be 2.5 times the amount of usable leisure water in the new Britannia than the Britannia that we want to close. Okay. And there's other things around facilities for the park in terms of sports facilities. So is, uh, in terms of the impact on the borough, providing a world-class leisure centre for one of the most deprived parts of the borough, I think is a massively positive impact uh, on the things that Jill listed. A fantastic okay. new secondary school, mixed denomination, uh, again. Okay, but she says asset. you don't really need a school at that end. She says that there isn't enough affordable housing, and she's, I think, judging by the leaflet she gave me on, on the, the way in this evening, a bit sceptical about whether this affordable housing will really happen. I, I don't want to put words into your mouth, but this seems to be. And that basically, you know, when you weigh up the, what he wants to do against what is there, you would sooner see the, the existing legislation And also we've recently refurbished. seen and studies coming after Grenfell have shown that um, high-rise towers are um, not exactly recommended okay, but and that's, yet so that's, we're, that's we're proposing to put four of them okay. in one place well, why on don't you Shoreditch answer that Park. particular point because that opens up a in slightly... In addition to all the other Yeah, but the, the, that particular issue of high-rise housing is, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a topic that concerns quite a lot of people at the moment for obvious reasons. I don't think, I don't think the conclusions of Grenfell is that tower blocks are a bad thing. Mm -hmm. I think there was a unique set of circumstances that does have wider implications for how we manage uh, housing and building regulation and all of those things and listening to residents that, that will be part of the inquiry, subcontracting, all of those things. I don't think living at height is fundamentally bad and I don't think living at density is fundamentally bad. If those two things did happen, then the future of London and the future of Hackney is quite bleak indeed. We need to build the homes that those residents in temporary accommodation need. We need to continue to invest Sorry, in our boroughs. Flats, uh, we uh, need to invest in the boroughs' infrastructure. Okay. So those things, uh, you know, we don't always deliver at height in the borough, and there are parts of the borough that have far, far different uh, access to public transport where we look at different types of housing, mansion blocks and things like that. Okay. And I've been very clear in the design work around those Britannia Towers that they must also be good places to live. We're not just building towers there to generate income, they've also got to be good places that people okay. want to live and be part of the community. Are you asking people, uh, Phil, to accept uh, a, a sort of fundamental conundrum, really, if you want to get things done 
in, in Hackney or anywhere else, is if you want, if you, uh, want a new state-of-the-art leisure centre and other stuff for community use, if you're going to get the money together to build those things, you actually, literally, have to put up or allow the building of a lot of very expensive residential properties. Isn't that a fact of life? Unpalatable as it may be to a lot of people in this room and perhaps to you as well. Is that not, are you saying that that is a fact of life in getting things done in Hackney these days? We're, we're very clear whether it's building genuinely affordable homes or building leisure centres or schools, the only way to generate that income is for the council to sell private properties or okay. rent out private properties or invest in commercial real estate. Because that raises are, the money that's to the pay cross the subsidy leisure centre. That's uh, what you're saying. That allows us to do that. Okay. And but to just we, say, that to, okay. to build one single council home requires the sale of two private homes on average across the borough. You just about might get one for one in Shoreditch with the, the prices that you get there. But that's the fundamental level of investment that you need to build okay. a council home. Could I, Pat, you, Pat, I know you wanted I to... I wanted to finish uh, up my question. Well, okay, fine. Which is, um, why is feasibility study, together with costing and assumptions not being made public, given that you value openness as per your statement uh, for this yeah. meeting? There are always, with development, going to be commercially sensitive documents. To get the best value of mon for money for the taxpayer means that some of that work that looks at the viability of the scheme and its financial makeup, we can't make public uh, before we've contracted somebody uh, to build it and before we finish the work around the architecture. As soon as we can release that information, we will do so. Okay, I think that's a fair answer. Oh. Pat, no, hold, hold on. So, I saw your hand up. I'll come to you next. Did you want to come in on a general point about the, the housing that's, that's proposed for this scheme and you wanted to make a broader point uh, about housing? Right, I'd just like to respond so, yeah. before I ask my question. Is it okay, okay if, if I respond quick, to the please. things? Of course I'll be brief. But Phil just mentioned a figure of £17 million for refurbishing the Britannia. Well, it's gone up again. We've had figures of £5 million and £14 million, And none of this has been justified because our freedom of information requests about how much it would cost have not been answered. Um, the 400 luxury homes are three tower blocks 24 storeys high, which will force up rents in the area for people who live there and for businesses. And um, as to these being built for people to live in, the <coughs> neighbouring towers on Colville Estate are being sold as an investment or pied a terre, the 198 homes that are already being built on neighbouring Colville Estate. So I don't think these are actually homes for uh, Hackney people to live in at all. Okay. And my question is, um, why does the Britannia Development Board, which is overseeing the plan to demolish Britannia Leisure Centre and put 400 luxury flats on the site, have no representation from Britannia users or local residents, and why are there no minutes? Okay, over to you. There's a lot, there's a lot in what Pat said. Uh, I'd like to take uh, issue with the idea these are just luxury flats and we don't, we don't care what, how they're sold or how they're marketed. As far as I'm aware, Hackney Council is the only public body that actually has started to put in place what Sadiq Khan had talked about and have homes for private sale prioritised for Londoners. So very clearly at Kings Crescent and at Colville there's an upper limit to the number of homes that can be sold to foreign investors and buy-to-let investors. <laughs> At King's Crescent, not a single private sale home has been sold to a foreign investor and only six to buy to let out of 150 private sale homes. At Colville, the developers are allowed to sell a proportion to investors, but then they must go back to selling locally and to Londoners to live in those towers. That is written into the contract. That is the same principle we will apply to the 400 homes at uh, Britannia if they're taken forward following the consultation. And I believe passionately that you don't just market uh, uh, abroad and you don't just work with people that want to market abroad. Uh, and that's something we've embedded into those sale properties. Okay. Um, I have to talk about the transparency of the board. But if you, if so you'll the be brief because I want to bring this lady in in a moment. Well, that no, was no, part... I think... I think, I think, I think the Britannia Development Board is an internal board of the council. It's not a public body. It looks at all of those documents. We've had a massive amount of engagement with the community. We've held four different design seminars around public realm, around the design of the centre, around what leisure centre users want in there. The original design for the leisure centre only had two squash courts. 
Uh, it's now got the four that the existing Britannia has. All of that design work around the swimming pool has come from users, users of the leisure centre. So you, very transparently, the input of, of people that use okay. that leisure centre okay. is intrinsic to the design of that body, and okay. that is how we've engaged with the community. I don't think we're going to agree on this point, but I think we've probably had enough on that. I'd like to bring in this lady who's been waiting very patiently to ask a question. Mayor, you are doing a good job with your member of staff in Acne. In second, in, Sc in Scotney House, we have 82 residents. Could you please provide us ramp for older people and mothers with buggies and pram for easy access? Older people who has mobility, mobility cars, they cannot get out of the Scotney House. The government sent them to old people home against their freedom of movement. It is we tenants, leaseholders, freeholders, have asked your staff of average of 30 years in the service of Hackney, the number of the flat on top of our individual flat from bottom to the top. No staff knows this. Okay. Sleeping rough, your staff do move them. If one goes, another group comes back. The hand of your staff are tight. Please help the people at Scotney House to rehouse them. Why leaseholder should be paying service charge of Frampton Park Estate and the block of Scotney House as well? They were paying for CCTV that are not in use. Are you please, coming to the end of please, your question now? Please, I think we need, I think please, we need to let him yes, answer. Yes, with, Yes, for fund from the public to support your government to do what you need to do to save the life of people in Acne and beyond from shoddy job that will take life away from family and their relatives. Okay, thank you very much. Thank so you. quite a lot of ground to cover there. Uh, thank you. Two, two very, uh, it's going to be a quick response. Uh, both my officer in the balcony and the cabinet member for housing services uh, is behind you. I'm not aware of the ramp issue before, but I will take that back and see what we can do. There is quite an issue around the design uh, of the entrance to that block. So while within the block there are lifts, I know there are steps going up from the, the, the main road and it's probably quite difficult to redesign it with a ramp, but we can go away and explore that. In terms of CCTV, I always say when people say it's not working, it is working more often than not, but it isn't you, you don't look at the images unless someone asks to see them. So you need proactive housing management and you need proactive police investigations to ask the council for those images. What you don't have is a person looking at every single camera uh, all of the time. They're constantly recording every 24 hours okay. and if there's an incident, people can tap into them. But you do actually need either a resident complaining, a housing manager or a police officer and enforcement person to say, I want to see that image at that time to investigate X. Okay. And that's where some people think they're not working uh, because something hasn't been spotted uh, and responded to. It actually needs that Okay. So uh, can you once again point resident. out the person that the, the officer that the lady asked oh. the person needs to speak to? So Councillor Council Mackenzie, who's waving behind me, is the cabinet member for housing so, services. All right, so remember uh, that. So man we can either chat him. later or and get him at the end, okay? <laughs> get hold of him at the end. Yeah. So we had one hand up here, so sorry? Regarding these holders. Is it time for the question or well, if, it, if you've got, if you've got, a, 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 if you, what, what's your question about? If you, I'd ask well, it quickly. Well, I'm a leaseholder. Okay. And at the moment, there's a block drain in Churchill Walk. It's affecting my bathroom. I can't use my bath. Okay. All right. So this is, I think, I think what, I'm gonna, what I'm going to say is that this is a particular, a particular problem you've got. You're probably better off. No, I was told that I need to pay to clear it. When Sorry? the drain is, I was told that I have to pay because I'm a, a leaseholder. The council can't, well, I'm a lease holder, so I must pay to clear it. Okay. When okay. It's, a, it's a sheer drain where other neighbors are using it. So why should I pay? All oh, right, okay, all right. This is a, right, this is a, why should I pay for, this is why should I pay for services that I'm, that other people are using? Right, got it. Okay, do you want to answer that one? Because that, that did come, that one has come up. It's been quite, it yeah. Quite interesting. I didn't really appreciate this issue before, so thank you for 
So I think in terms of your individual circumstances, we'll have to go away and look at the situation exactly where you live. But in terms of that broader question about le how leaseholders are charged, by, by and large, if there's works to an estate or block, it is, it is proportioned uh, by the number of properties in that block. And if there are leaseholders there, then they pay their contribution uh, towards the upkeep of their block. The biggest controversial area, though, in the borough is where you've got estate roads and estate layouts that appear to look like the public highway, but actually are private council housing land. If they're not adopted, even if public has access to them, they're the responsibility of the council and the leaseholders on those uh, estates. I'm very keen to see what we can do to adopt more of our public realm and bring it up to the standards that the rest of the public realm, like our parks and roads, have. But that requires quite a lot of investment okay. uh, and uh, it is not easy to do. Oh. So if you're on one of those estates, especially those that are built in the, the 60s and 70s that are more low rise, oh. uh, you, 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 own, you can even own a freehold house and okay. you're responsible for the um, upkeep of that public realm and it can feel like you're paying uh, twice, but that's it's very clearly in the lease why that position is there, and those areas of that estate are communal areas of the estate that the the tenants through their rent and the leaseholders through their service charge are responsible Helpful. for. Okay, all right, okay. Could I, the gentleman here had his hand up. Are you on, is this on a similar subject, sir? Uh, it's to do with um, the redevelopment policies and the e uh, clever economics of that. Is that sort of touching on what we were speaking about in connection with Britannia? Is it yes. that sort of... Okay, let's, yes. let's do that one, because it's an interesting subject, so... I mean, I understand that what you are doing is very focused on how to provide public service housing, affordable housing, uh, within a context where you don't have a national budget for doing that, but you have to by clever design, fit in an element of affordable housing into a much larger scheme, whether it's a leisure centre, whether it's uh, that's, that's, housing that's for private sale. But the, 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 le the project length of those projects is a number of years, usually, and you're doing that within the context of uh, very volatile London house prices at the moment, and they're right. becoming right. rather negative. Right. What effect does that ha have on you over the length of projects like that? So if house prices drop, expensive properties come down in price, you get less out of it for everybody else. Is that... It can happen, absolutely. It's a very good question. I think the answer to that is we're quite conservative about the values we attach to the private homes that we sell. So we've not built, if you think of the rise in house prices that we've seen over the last 10 years that may well have dampened now, we didn't build in an assumption about that in our estate regeneration programmes and we're making very conservative assumptions in the Britannia scheme. It could be that if those homes go to, go to the market uh, uh, and the market continues to, to dampen, that we decide to rent them out instead using the, uh, a council letting agency or the housing company that we're thinking about setting up. And then we could see some of those homes going to private rental, either at living rent or market rent. And then when the situation uh, improves, then they're sold to repay the investment that we need at Britannia. So we've got some flexibility. And I think the critical aspect of flexibility that we have is that we're the lead developer in these developments. We're not relying on an external organisation to do the work around the architecture, an external organisation to do the work around viability. The council is the developer there, and we have control in terms of uh, the parameters that we set. And ultimately, you could mothball some of the housing and not, not deliver it immediately, uh, and we would have a higher level of loan uh, and borrowing on the council's books, but we wouldn't, we wouldn't have to develop that housing in that way at that, that time. Some of our estate regeneration programmes are desperately needing to happen on a timeline to rehouse the residents on those estates into, into new homes. And I would, I would not want to see those paused. But if we're talking about some of the infill type development, ultimately you could not proceed if the viability uh, uh, fell away and you couldn't sell homes. I think more broadly, I'd like a, a flatter, more soft housing market in London because 
we need to have earnings catch up to the, the cost of buying new homes in places like Hackney. So the delivery of more homes in the long run will hopefully dampen house prices. But obviously, as you said, if you're doing that cross-subsidy, that can have an impact so on our development. What it boils down to is it's mad, it's very difficult to predict what's going to happen next. And you have to, if you're in this position, you've got to try and deal with the, you know, you've got to deal with the, with the cards you're dealt. And that is one of the big problems with delivering affordable housing or indeed housing of any kind. And, and, and just to add at King's Crescent... To be nice to him, you know, it's not something I intend no, to make a habit of. No, but to, to say at King's Crescent, if you're marketing to Hackney residents, even if they're Hackney residents that can afford private sale, the market for people moving around Hackney is more buoyant than that investor market that so many of the big property developers are developing for across London in places like Nine Elms, Canary Wharf and other big regeneration mm. schemes. So the people that have really suffered are those that are trying to do, have the investor model, not those that are marketing to local people. And we haven't seen a softening of people wanting to live in Hackney, that know Hackney, that want to put down roots here. We've seen a softening of those that are worried about Brexit, the volatility of the pound, and making investment decisions. Okay. So I think that model of actually selling the homes ourselves as well as building them uh, means that we're in okay. a better position as well to sort of ride out some of those market fluctuations. That's great. Well, we'll allow the audience to digest that very full and interesting answer. And I'm now going to get back to the script because we've only done two questions. We've been going nearly an hour. And the next question, uh, number three, is about another very, very important issue, uh, crime and antisocial behaviour. And I'm told that the person who submitted this question definitely isn't here. So I'm going to steam ahead and answer, ask it. Musa Jabbar? Uh, no. no, okay. I'm going to ask. Musa here. Oh, you are Musa's here. here. Oh, I'm sorry. I was told you weren't going to be here. No, no. I prefer you. You'd, you'd still, of course, that's right. I remember now. I will ask the, ask the question for you. Okay. So uh, the question is what, it, what are the Mayor and Hackney Council doing in conjunction with the police about the huge spike in antisocial behaviour and moped crime in the borough? I have lived in Stanford Hill all my life. And over the past four to five months, the situation is the worst that I and many residents have witnessed uh, for the last 10 or 15 years. And myself and my young family do not feel safe and secure when we walk down our own streets. Now, we all know about that burst of moped crime, very horrible stuff that went on a while back. And there was a very particular incident in the Stamford Hill area, I think, in June, if I remember rightly, related to uh, a party that was going on somewhere. I, I don't remember that clearly. But it did strike me, so you said I don't live in Stamford Hill, but it did strike me that there seems to be a lot of stuff going off in that part of the borough. So, so what's the situation now, Mr Mayor, and what are you doing about it? It's an incredibly challenging situation in London and in Hackney. So I think it's very important to level with the residents of Hackney that cr crime for the first time is going back up crime and antisocial behaviour. We'd had a benign period where crime was coming down, uh, antisocial behaviour was coming down, uh, and that has gone into reverse. I do, I will put some of the responsibility out again to national government. We've seen cuts for the Met of £600 million so far with another £400 million to go. We've lost one in four Hackney police officers in the last seven years. And that means that when you used to have six, borough, uh, sorry, six police officers per ward, there are now only two. That has an impact on community relations and it has an impact uh, on, on local responsiveness. So we, are, we have consistently campaigned for a return of our police officers. Uh, and I think the Met, if you've been dealing with them at Wilberforce Road, at Dalston Square, some of the other hotspots, you, you have to reach a certain level of tasking in order to get the resources that we know we need to uh, police some of those uh, can, can issues. Can you explain that a bit? That, what do you mean by that? A certain level of tasking? Well, you, you're, you're relying on residents and the council to provide the evidence to say we need specific okay. operations right. to deal with these types uh, uh, of incidents. And then you've got some of those common crimes like the, the rise in mopeds, uh, the rises in knife crime. Uh, and the, the thing I would say is that, by and large, the rises in Hackney are still lower than the rises that we've seen uh, elsewhere. But we've got some significant challenges around moped crime, which is predominantly a crime in Islington, Hackney, and neighbouring boroughs. So we're talking with those neighbouring boroughs. We've got some challenges coming down in terms of the way that the Met is being reorganised. So they're moving to joint borough command units, which means 
Camden and Islington, Enfield and Haringey and Hackney and Tower Hamlets are going together. So if you lived in Finsbury Park, for instance, mm -hmm. you might feel, as some residents do, that the, that the attention is moving away from what is actually a hotspot of antisocial behaviour and crime. Okay. It's up to us as borough leaders and community leaders to say, actually, no, there's some specific issues in parts of our borough on those boundaries between Islington and Hackney and Haringey. Uh, that need that attention. We've kept up the investment in our own work in this area. So youth services, uh, outreach, CCTV, visible enforcement, all of those things we know make a difference to our partnership working with police and we're maintaining that investment in it. Okay. Uh, I, and I think those things are what is important in making sure that the council can join with our police partners, advocate for more police resources, but also trying to respond to those okay. uh, issues. We had a hand up over there and some more coming, so we'll go to that gentleman first. Uh, good evening, Phil. Um, tell me something, how much does it cost to have police on the beat, like we used to have in the 70s and like early 80s? You know, how much does it actually cost? Because you don't see them anymore. You know, you don't see uh, uh, police doing their beats, you know, like they used to. And, you know, they're always driving around. Now, you know, you don't, you don't really see them. The only time you do see them is when something really serious has happened. And right. that's, what I, that's what I think we need on the street, police on the beat. Okay, it's a good question. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't agree more, and that's why I said, uh, up to 2010, you had those six uh, ward officers in every ward, mixture of PCSOs, mixture of sergeant, uh, and the PCs. When I was first elected as a councillor in 2006, there was one beat officer for Hoxton. Within a year, there were six, now there's two. That's the art we've been on, and the bell curve of the crime has gone down and back up again in Hackney. We need a return to those officers. We've had 600 million taken out, uh, and it's one in four officers within Hackney going. Uh, the other aspect of that is because we brought crime down in Hackney, they put other parts of our resources into those areas of London that hadn't seen that fall in crime. So you're sort of, you're, 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 you're penalised for doing a good job. So we're also saying you need to look at the, the fundamentals of the funding formula and say, actually, Hackney's still got these challenges. And we need that resources to do that partnership work uh, to make sure that they're dealt Can with. I just, uh, we'll come on to the other people who raised their hand in a moment. Phil said that there was a time not long ago when there were more visible police officers on the streets. You made your comparison with decades past the 1970s, which is perfectly fine, but have you noticed recently uh, 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 the, uh, there are fewer visible police officers on foot in your area. You okay, never see you, you never see po any okay. police officers walking around anymore. We really don't. Okay. And, 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 and a few years ago, that's what we need more. Did you see a few more a few years ago? Do you think? Or I think if we had more police on the beat, walking walking the streets, okay, right, that uh, it would become a, more of a deterrent to people who wanted to commit violent crime. Yeah. I understand your point. Thank you very much for making it. Now, the two hands that came up first, that gentleman I saw, and that lady, there you go, lady of the yellow scarf there. Thank you. As Philip pointed out, Sam, we all need to work together on this issue. My problem I got at the moment is regarding the antisocial behavior team at Clock House. Uh, sorry, no. I didn't catch that what you said. Could you say that again? Where? Uh, a clock house. A clock, okay, yeah, sorry. On Stanford Hill. Yeah. Uh, as you really probably know, we had uh, stabbings back in July, and James McDade mentioned earlier on, and myself have tried and tried to sit down with them. This is uh, nearly three months now. We had uh, acid attacks. We got, <coughs> we got major problem on the estate, and I was promised on Saturday in front of this own building, then today I will be called by our pal. The day has gone, I'm still waiting. Okay. What's going on? Shall we take the next question and then you can come back okay. to two of them and then we'll have some more questions. Hi, my, I'm represent the Kingsmead State residents, Kingsmead State residents. Yeah. Uh, the bad drinking habit, what we heard, and Hackney, especially in there, when we call in the police, never coming. What we need to do to improve the, the young generation to drinking? That is my worry, uh, worry of President Hackney. Okay, um, do you want to take those two questions first? Thank you very much, and we'll, we'll, we'll have some more in a moment. 
I obviously came out and said I believed it was about funding for the police and about numbers, but it is also about those support services and making sure you don't just look at a crime when it's occurred. And that's why it's important that we still have funding for our youth services, funding for those support services, funding around mental health and support. They're all under pressure as well, and I, uh, I admit that, and so they're being asked to do more uh, with less in some cases. But you must look at something holistically, some of those causes of crime, making sure that you know you have that relationship around economic activity and all of those things. I think it's a very difficult message, but even if the police don't come, that call is logged. And in terms of that tasking that I mentioned earlier, getting through to 101, reporting it online, reporting it through 999, even if the police do not come out, is important. There is nothing worse than turning up at a police meeting in, an, in a ward to be told by the police we haven't had any calls about that because people have given up on the phones and they've given up on calling or the council services haven't passed over that data. And that, that is very difficult. I was on a, a, a meeting at Kingsmead where people were saying, I've been on 101 for 50 minutes. Sure. And they don't, they don't come, they don't report okay. it. We really do need people, if we're to make that argument about resources for the borough and also about tasking for the police, that people do bear with it and do it. I've seen the screen grabs of people's phones where they've been on there for 51 minutes uh, trying to get through to 101. Mm -hmm. And it's also why we'd be push pushing back. The Met is planning to close another police station in the borough and so they're going to improve alternative forms uh, of reporting. While we know the situation with those alternative forms already are very difficult uh, and we have to make sure that people can get through can, uh, and, uh, and approach those officers and as well as the visibility on the street we need the 101 and 999 to work for, for us because they're so critical to the picture of what's happening in the borough. And that would help you sir I think. Oh, we've had this one already. Are they working or not? Camera, cameras go down occasionally, but the CCTV in the borough is monitored. There's repairs contract in place. Some of our housing estates now tap into it, I would suggest. I'm very happy to engage on individual areas where people claim that the CCTV isn't working, but it relies on people intelligently using it. If something happens in front of a CCTV camera, that might not be being monitored at that particular time. It relies on an individual or a statutory agency to say, look at that footage. Okay. Uh, and then that's used to, to piece together an evidence case against criminal behaviour or antisocial behaviour. They can tap into any camera in the borough from Stoke Newington at any time, 24 hours a day, but they're not going to be looking at a camera if they don't know something's happening. Okay. And that's where you get, again, that is it working or not? It usually is. But the housing manager has to say, I want that lift camera uh, at 6 o'clock on Friday afternoon when someone urinated in that lift. All right, thanks. We had some, can we move on to some, there was a gentleman at the back and uh, that lady there as well. He hasn't answered your question. We'll, no, we'll so, so the antisocial behaviour team that uh, is being referred to is the housing antisocial behaviour team. Yeah. I can't speak for why you weren't called back today, but they are supposed to be better integrated with the council's antisocial behaviour service, uh, and I happily take that take that away. Okay. Well, do you want to just answer that for a bit and promise this lady that you will deal with the, the there's question? A, there's, a, there's a lot in there behind that. We're, we're faced with 1% rent cuts a year and making savings on our housing side. We haven't cut investment in antisocial behaviour, but we have decided to do it in a different way. And actually, we're funding a lot of the wardens to make sure there's dedicated warden resource for our states, not just the antisocial behaviour team. So one of the challenges used to be is getting visible warden presence on an estate to deal with antisocial behaviour on our estates. And we've actually invested in that to make sure there are people that can come down and work with the police and work with residents to make sure stairwells are safe and some of those areas are causing antisocial behaviour. Okay. There are a lot of reorganisations within housing when it came over to the council, mm. but we're not, we're we're not cutting investment in repairs, we're not cutting investment in, in those housing services, but we are delivering them in different ways. 
Okay, will that do for now? And I ask the fellow at the back who's been waiting very patiently. Uh, hello, my name's David, also from Wilberforce Road, actually, but I wasn't going to touch on that straight away. Um, my, my question's a broader question about the antisocial behaviour. Um, it's interesting, just an observation, just now, more people are asking questions about antisocial behaviour than they are about social housing and the housing side of things. So I was just wondering if there could be some creative ideas, like the great example you gave about selling private properties to raise funds for you know, social housing, whether there be something like that, something creative to raise the funds for policing to combat the antisocial behaviour rather than blaming the government, because who knows whether they're going to cut more than the 600 million or less, we don't know what's going to happen there. So is there something we can do on that front, just off the back of the audience feedback tonight as an example, that maybe there's 13,000 people who need you know, cheaper housing, but how many people are there in the borough that want a safer neighbourhood? Okay, thanks. Sir. Let's have that lady's question as well, and then you can perhaps deal with the two together. Just along here, that's it. Maria Glanville. Uh, I live in the Homerton area, which is the most deprived area in Hackney. When we talk about antisocial behaviour, we have got it. But we, as a TRA, have identified ways to officer to combat the antisocial behaviour that's happening on our estate, but we are not listened to. How can you reassure us to make us feel safe living on our estates. We know there's a cut in the police. We know that there are less resources to go around. But saying that doesn't make us feel safe. We want to work with the council. We come up with a solution, but we're not listened to. OK, so, so do them both in either order. My experience of 11 years of working with TRAs is, A, they definitely do need to be listened to. But if you're involved in any reorganisational layouts of estates and you start bringing in things like fencing or demolishing buildings or interesting, introducing CCTV, if you do that just with the TRA and don't involve the rest of the estate in that discussion, you're, you're in, you can get into deep trouble because one person's fencing is another area of having an estate blocked off. Demolishing garages is a resource that uh, other people value sealing up uh, walkways on estates. Some people value it, some people make it feel that it makes an estate feel like a prison. Some people love CCTV, some people think it's a threat on civil liberties. So I think when you're having those discussions with the TRA, you sometimes have to go beyond that into the wider estate and make sure they listen, but then you also have to have officers that are responsive and want to engage and work with residents. You're shaking so, your head very so sceptically. you said the ga freeing up the garages would be loss of resources resources to who my safety yeah are you putting garages before my safety i'm talking about cars pulling up and hiding between the garages wiping down cars knives two sheets shooting on the estate in july alone yeah and all behind the garages. So you're saying to me, I need to walk out into that. And as I walk out of my door, and other residents walk out the door, they're faced with a garage. They've got nowhere to go. So when you say the removing of the garages, I can understand that it will be difficult. You have to consult. I do understand that. But you can't put the resources and the revenue that you get from a few garages to the safety of residents. And that's what I want you to answer to. How are you going to make the residents feel safe? We would never put the revenue of garages before the safety of residents, but people use those garages and other people might have a different view about the layout of an estate. And you have to do that broader consultation. You can't just listen to the loudest residents first and close off areas and demolish things. You must take a community with us. I've 
borne the scars of taking the support of a TRA, going out there advocating for something, uh, closing off parts of an estate and then finding out that a whole other community doesn't want that to happen and then having to have those things removed or reinstated. We must make sure that we take a community holistically with us and if that means a deeper look at the layout of your estate then that is exactly what we should deliver but I, I, with the greatest respect I don't think you can just say I want those garages removed, swift uh, uh, piece of the pen and, the, and I've been involved in the particular case for about three years and it has been sort of around the houses but I don't I don't, I don't think uh, it, it's not about whether we get income from those garages because we demolish garages in other places. Do you think that to pick up David's yes, point yeah, yeah, at the back, we are being creative. We're, we're introducing a late night levy. So one of the sources of crime and antisocial behaviour is the burgeoning local nighttime economy. And rather than seeing council taxpayers picking that up, uh, either in uh, the, the precept going to the mayor and funding police or the council having to step in uh, and spend money on that. We're introducing a levy on businesses that open after midnight and that will be spent on policing, cleansing and the council's response to antisocial behaviour. And I think that is absolutely right, given that those businesses make that contribution. And that means that that money and resources that we're putting into that type of work at the moment can be diverted to other things uh, around antisocial behaviour as well. So I do think we will be creative. What I don't support I think is lots and lots of separate uh, sort of private security type options I think if we can fund warden service we can fund the police that is a better response than having private security firms on our estates and on our streets because the accountability and the training that you get if you have a, a responsible and accountable force is far better than uh, the, than hiring security guards and, and private CCTV uh, but I appreciate that if you're uh, living with that type of situation, you want resources there immediately uh, now. Uh, if we can engineer more resources, we've, uh, we've got a bigger frontline uh, and social behaviour team than we used to have because of the way we've reconfigured internally. So hopefully we'll be have more resources okay. out there for the street. Do you want to come back quickly on what he said? Yeah. So that's, good. that's great. I think the, the more creative thing, though, is from what, what I've heard tonight, is that the selling of private, you know, expensive private properties to reap the rewards of that to put them in, people into social housing. I mean, why couldn't you, for example, have a condition that instead of just Hackney residents, they have to be Hackney police officers? So if you're a police officer, you get a discounted accommodation in the new block in Britannia. You know, Britannia or so. I'm just thinking off the top of my head, but ideas to get more police officers, because the problem I have with the incident in Wilberforce Road, which I don't want to go into, but the CCTV, the security guards, it just pushes these guys onto the next street and then they go on to the next street. And so it's not going away, it's just like shifting dirt off around a window. You never get rid of it, you're just pushing it onto the next one. But if there were more police officers, I think that would fix the problem. And we've had examples that in the last few decades, it wasn't like this. So to me, personally, this is me really feeling the austerity measures that have come through on the government firsthand. And I don't think that's gonna get fixed quick. Okay. So I think it's something that Hackney has to fix. And that's why I'm, out. and again, for me, it's interesting sat here and seeing so many more questions about this than they are about affordable housing. Okay, that's very good. Thank you. So it's now my cue to ask, is there anybody else who wants to make a point? Perhaps someone who hasn't made a, asked a question so far on this particular subject of crime and antisocial behaviour. Anybody around here? There's someone who hasn't asked a question already. So can, would you mind if I took this lady's question? Thank you. Just coming back on the police being um, discounted residents, we had exactly the same thing and then they all bought and moved out within two, three years. So there should be a condition that they have to stay in the area if they are going to get housing because we had four flats that did happen and all of them moved out. Where do they go? Do you know? Like Sorry. Way out of London. <laughs> <laughs> they all live in villages in you know, the commuter belt. <laughs> Sorry. Come on then, if you're, if you're quick. Take the microphone, please, As thank you. As people here probably guess, Wilberforce Road, around there, we're, we're seriously, seriously pissed, excuse the language. One of the issues with ESPO, and I want this is a much more general question, I'm seeing a particular age group. I'm seeing predominantly masculine, some women, some girls, sorry. Oh, when I've spoken directly, I also work have worked with special needs, kids excluded from schools, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, it's, it's a, a familiar territory to me. And I asked them, why are you here? 
got nowhere else to go, miss. Go to the park, I said. Can't miss, we get stopped, miss. We get searched, miss. They have nowhere to go. This is, I, I came and I caused great grief for my neighbors because I actually said I would support the youth. I went to social services. I got Hackney Youth Service. I connected them to places that I work. So, but I've got considerable grief off neighbors for that. But I will stand by it. These kids are, I don't have polite words left. Their future is zero. Semi-educated, no housing, beginning, you know, they're on ASBO land, they're juvies. The only way they're gonna go is big in it. They're being exploited by bigger and clever dealers who are bringing stuff okay. in. So what's your solution? What's, it's, I don't have a, well, actually, I, I bet do. you do. Yeah, I bet no, you have an do. ideal but it's world much solution. It's more about education, looking at how we educate and what we educate okay. for. The whole key stages, step, oh, right. etc. Okay. We need manual labour. We need this is, proper apprenticeships. This is going to become a very big philosophical yeah, no, discussion enormous, now. But I want to ask them, okay. how do you see it? Because uh, our problem isn't going to go away. Yes, some of them we can nick. Some are truly bad, but a great lot of them aren't. Can you be how quick, can Phil, we, because how do let, you let him answer the question and then let's move on, because we've got several other people who want to ask questions. Uh, just, just on the affordable housing for police, I think we've got, I'm, I'm very nervous about saying that the police deserve housing over nurses, over social workers, over charity workers, over people that make this borough tick, and that's why I prefer an income-based look that you aren't, you aren't just housing teachers, you aren't just housing police, you're housing people that can't afford to live in the borough that earn that type of money. And then also, that means that if someone who works for the police suddenly becomes a nurse or vice versa, they aren't putting their housing at, at, at risk. And I think there's too, been too much key worker housing where people have either tried to you know, get a job in the public sector and then swiftly move out of it, uh, and, and things like that. If you have it based on income, then it's, it's fairer and okay. more transparent. Okay. To answer the question about our young people, mm -hmm. Uh, I think the answer there is nowhere to go is a simple barefaced lie. We have some of the best well funded and run youth centres uh, in London. We've maintained those services. We've now got outreach services. We're looking at contextual youth uh, work in our social services to look at those settings out there in the community that allow that kind of grooming and behaviour to take place. So, okay. so I, I can't speak for other, other boroughs on that, although I, I appreciate there needs to be a response. But what I would say is there is criminality there and you have to tackle the criminality as well as those support services. So it's the apprenticeships I talked about earlier. Hackney's record on school improvement is, is, is second to none and making sure that our young people leave with the skills they need for the modern world. I, what I want to do more work on is those that don't head off to university and that says that they're valued that we invest in their skills, and that's why the apprenticeship program, looking at adult learning, looking at our two colleges like B6 uh, mm -hmm. and, and the community college, and making sure that those outcomes right. are as good as they can be. That's a pretty full answer, and a fairly, fairly brisk one. So I'm now going to ask if Jackie Myers is here, please. Hello, Jackie. You've got a question. We've already touched on this a bit, but there's plenty of mileage in it. Housing repairs and estate management. Hi. Yeah, um, I'm from Woodbury Down, as you know. Um, I've waited over two years for my dank work to be started to be doing. Uh, I also have children that are quite severely disab has disabilities and also the under, under the age of five. I would like to know what you intend to do to get your repair system working uh, a bit better than it is and to so it doesn't leave people like myself and my children that have disabilities in okay. these terrible conditions for years and which also has a knock on effect with our health not only physically but mentally thank you very much for your question and it's a question I you know every time I do meetings like this you hear this question so it's a good and important one so please let's have a nice full answer so there's, there's several aspects of, uh, of this. Uh, we've, we've, we're on a journey with our repair service. There were periods up very recently where people were waiting up to half an hour to get through to the repair service. We've now got that call centre down to 20 seconds. But then it's what happens next. The real challenge is around contracting and complex repairs. Very few people write to me or my colleagues saying that they, the Hackney internal housing staff, those people that have been apprentices, that are doing those repairs around, around gas, carpentry, electrics, leaks, 
that directly work for the council, those things tend not to go wrong. Where they go wrong is where it's a complex job, like in, in your home, where you've got damp and condensation, void flats, issues with the roof, issues with the walls, those sorts of things, where you're using our contractors. And that's where it's just simply not good enough. We've changed contractors. Uh, we've, we've brought services back into the council, uh, but it's only a steady level of improvement. We've seen uplift uh, from 81% uh, of jobs getting sold first time to now in the mid-90s. But once you start to land on problems like yours, it just simply isn't good enough. And I've known your case now, what, for 15 months? Uh, and, and elected, and I, and I failed, and admit that. And we spoke about it on Saturday uh, as well. Uh, and it's simply not good enough. There are some complexities around will be down in the nature of that stock, but that isn't a good enough answer either. So I, I, I just have to apologize for what's happened to you and say that we are trying to put that right. I think it goes back to the issues like Grenville, though, and subcontracting. We need those internal skills, the surveyors, the workforce to be in-house, not motivated by the profit motive, uh, and serving a community that they ideally live in as well. And I think then the quality of the services that people receive uh, will be a lot better. And Hackney Council, by and large, preserves in prefers in-house services. We've brought a lot of services in-house, first into Hackney Homes uh, and then into the council. We need to grow that direct labour and mean that things like scaffolding is done in-house, that we're not putting up scaffolding and leaving it up and our contractors saying it's been taken down and you're chasing your tail. I see all of that in my casework day in, day out, and it's simply uh, not good enough. But to change the way the industry works takes time. Uh, uh, and it takes time to build that in-house workforce and get those professional skills back and stop using consultants uh, and outsource uh, labour. Can I interrupt? Does that sound like a, a good answer to you? I know it's not your problem, um, doesn't... She's heard it before, though, I, know, I have to I, admit. I, I understand that yeah, it isn't going to... I have gonna, heard a lot of I, I understand before. that it's not going to solve your problem, um, but as but a principle... Sorry, as a, as a principle, the idea that the council is more direct, has more direct control over more complex repairs, such as the ones you are I faced don't with, think you would you be happier with the council the than with, with, than with a private company? For two years. So I don't think you have control. I just, okay. what I miss is that one person I can talk to um, instead, because I've got millions of emails from mm. totally different people right. who won't, deals with something, then disappears, <laughs> and then I have somebody else and somebody else. I have one good point that I have a really good cancer that works on my ward and she does amazingly for me, What's the Caroline Selwyn. She can wait. Here. Um, <laughs> so yeah, go. she really pushes for me. I know she does. Um, but I just feel the council has severely let me and my children down. Okay. But I, d I do feel from... Okay. I'm in the old building, yes. I'm on an estate that's under major redevelopment. And we do feel, even I personally feel, that us who are in the older blocks are being very neglected. What, 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 uh, is there a plan to give you a new home eventually? There is, but I've got at least another four to five years to so wait. Ago, and I'd like yeah. a nice home for me and my children to live in. Yeah. I don't want to be breathing in damp spores. I've now been diagnosed with asthma and things like that now since this has all been going on. Does anybody want to, sorry, Jackie, does anybody in the audience want to come in on any of the points that Jackie has made? Some, perhaps someone we haven't heard from already, with great respect to those we have. Yes, sir. Um, unfortunately, um, I have been badly let down by the council. I'm living in a, um, not what you call, um, in, a, in, in Stelman Close, by the way. Free, um, leasehold. Um, the council have, about a couple of years ago or so, they've come around and do all the houses with uh, what you call, um, you know, the, what's the word is? No, no, it has to do with the warming, you know, the insulation. insulation. Thank you. Um, they've done all the houses, they've done mine, but then sometime afterwards, a couple of months or so, a few months, they came back and do all the roofs, but they didn't mind. They came back again and they done all the windows and doors. They didn't mind. I'd like to know why I was not included. That's my question to the mayor. I'm, 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 I'm concerned you might be a freeholder. 
I am not a freeholder. Or if you're a leaseholder of a, of a house, yes. that might be some of the reasons that you've not been done. But if we can look into your individual circumstances, then I'm, I'm happy to do that. But obviously, it, the, the way that we prioritise uh, our, our investment is often to work towards blocks and houses that we directly manage. If we were to do your works, I'm sure you would have discussions with us about the scope of those works, uh, the timing of that investment, and ultimately all of the cost would be recharged to you as a leaseholder. Well, that won't be correct, Mr. Mayor. Okay. I know you've just come into the, to the room, not in the room here, but in the mayorship, yeah. um, because when the property was bought in 1984, it was an agreement with the council at the time that they would be responsible for all outward repairs, and I would be responsible for the in indoors. Yeah. So the council haven't done, kept their part of the bargain. No, but when we do, and when we make that investment, we'll be recharging you as a leaseholder. That, unless wasn't, that lease wasn't agreed. That was not I would agreed. be very surprised if that's what the lease it says. Was so. I think this might be... This, this is a we very might move into casework. This is a very particular thing. Can we... It was in June the 1980s. It was bought. And that was I'm very happy to look into it, sir. Will you, will, will you be able to speak or somebody yep, else will be able to speak to this one gentleman last question, after the One last meeting. question. If you're quick, oh, please. How soon can I expect a response from you, Mr. Mayor? I would, I would say month. A month? Yes. Okay, you've to got do that. Need, you'll need month. my details, won't you? Yep, so we'll do that afterwards. Can we move Thank on? You very much. Right, there you we'll go. We'll do that afterwards. It's a deal. So, so I, didn't, I didn't want to say with Jackie, obviously Woodbury Down is a, an estate that's come to the end of its life in terms of its structural mm -hmm. uh, 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 works, and that's why we're building the new homes there, and it's... The rephasing sometimes means that people get moved around in that phasing, and uh, the seven blocks and the area where Jackie, Jackie lived has sort of not done well out of some of that rephasing. But just to conclude on that point, we have invested in that existing stock. Unlike other councils, we've not decanted uh, all of our blocks and just run them down. We have done those interim repairs and made sure that, 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 that people that have had to wait longer get that investment. And unfortunately, Jackie's also been caught between that, those major works and the works to her home, and that's perhaps exacerbated the situation, I think, in uh, this Thanks very much for that answer. Now, we've got four questions uh, to go and half an hour to do them, so we're going to have to move quickly now to question number five, which is on mental health, and the person who submitted this question is Rose Auden. Is Rose here? Hello, Rose. Here comes a microphone. Thank you for your question. Hello, um, my name is Rose Van Auden. I'm a leaseholder on the Parkside Estate. Um, and I'm interested in the council's policy on residents' mental health, um, and in particular, what measures the council takes to ensure communications with residents take into account their mental health. And I'm thinking particularly of letters that come through people's doors. Well, that sounds a bit enigmatic. What do you mean by letters that come through people's doors? Um, well, Mayor Glanville will be aware of the issues on the Parkside Estate. Okay. Um, but I, I personally have received two letters this year referring to sums of money that are above the average national salary. Um, and they've kind of come out of the blue and they've got no sense of um, timings around them, no depth of information. I think we're, get, I think we're getting the so idea. So that's the so background. Thank you for that. Thanks for that. So can you... So that's quite useful because uh, I think broadly the, the Council on Mental Health is, is, is upping it, its game. We've now got a mental health champion who's one of the councillors. We're looking at training uh, across the board about how to work with people that have all sorts of mental health uh, challenges. We are doing a lot of joint commissioning with the local NHS and we want to destigmatise mental health and also consider it in a holistic way as we are with social uh, uh, social work as well, so we recognise the cumulative impact of that where people live on their mental health and need to think about those sorts of services. In terms of the sort of leaseholder charges letters uh, that you have received, there's been a lot of ongoing dialogue about the scope of those works. I think the councils have finally listened and we suspended uh, that, that programme and want to work with residents. But on, in terms of those major works costs, there is always a repayment option that doesn't involve people losing their home or being worried about being faced with debt or having to refinance uh, their home. Uh, and that we're supposed to put that in place very early, but I can appreciate that if you get a letter out of the blue that's saying, hey, I want, you know, the council wants £30,000, if you pay it early, it, you know, all of that, it, it cannot feel good enough. Why does the council want £30,000? Uh, to invest in the estate's infrastructure, so doors, windows... Uh, roofs, insulation, 
for the tenants, new kitchens and bathrooms, which the leaseholders don't pay for, and that's one of those common myths. Um, but what I don't like is where you try and have a dialogue with our, our services and they're not, they're not good enough at explaining the options uh, and they're not sympathetic enough and they somehow assume that leaseholders instantly have access to this kind of money. And I know myself and my colleague, uh, Councillor McKenzie, are very keen to improve that leaseholder service uh, to ensure that it, it treats people with much more respect and it talks to people about how those charges are, are levied so you can find out transparently why it's £30,000, but also the options uh, if it is £30,000 to repay those, those, those charges. Um, and that, that's, that's important okay. to me. Okay. What do you think of that answer, Rose? I appreciate it, and I, I'm, taking, I'm taking the mayor at his word because, I, for various reasons, I'm taking you at your word. Um, so thank you for that. And, yeah, I mean, I, I wanted this, this to be on our radar because those letters don't feel good. And I think it's just the lack of information and it's a lack of timelines and it's the lack of control that leaseholders feel they have. And it's, I think people with mental health issues, if they were received those letters in a certain frame of mind, it would, it, you'd be looking at a fairly, I think, you know, bad situation. So I, I appreciate your, your work in this area, so thanks. So the moral of this story seems to be, if you can draw a larger, larger moral of the story, is that the way that you communicate with people is very, very important to get rights if you can. Just and we shouldn't, to. fundamentally, we shouldn't be doing stuff to people. We should be doing stuff with people. Uh, and all too often, you're driven by an asset management plan that says, this is Parkside's time to have investment. Assume everyone will be grateful. Uh, and then it rolls out. Well, actually, if you explain the types of works that would be taking place, why they're taking place, and then work towards the cost, you get an involvement in the design. That is how this type of stuff should be rolling out in the future. And I've been given assurances that that's how it was going to, to play out, and then seeing that it didn't, and then having to pick up the pieces with residents like yourself, your local councillors, cabinet member and services. And that's very frustrating because... You know, it shouldn't require the mayor to intervene to get that kind of change. Okay, uh, lady here. Good evening. Hi. Um, I think this question has some has um, relevance to what I wanted to come to this meeting about as well, which is communication of Hackney Council. Mm -hmm. I feel there's often there's a problem with the communication that is given for, for example, this meeting for, is under attended and I, f I found it in a little slip in the Hackney Today. Um, I feel that you, we asked about this meeting to be about bringing new ideas and aspirations. I would like for the council to look at new ways of making more accessible, more up-to-date um, information. I'm a young person and the average young person is not sitting down reading the Hackney Today. How they're going to know where they should be to have their voices heard. Um, so that's my thing that I'm pointing out to you and I'd like to hear responses in some, in around, in some sort of reasonable measure of time, how are we going to improve the communication that Hackney Council does with us, because the Hackney Today is not enough, or acceptable, or up to date. I'm going to say something in his defence. I was told uh, this afternoon that, that, that you were expecting a full house, including the balcony, so it may be that quite a lot of people said they were going to come and then didn't. But I think your general point is obviously a fair one. You cannot improve... You know, good communication is so important. Oh, I've, we, we, we basically... Obviously, it's a free event, so sold out isn't the right word, but we, we had 160 tickets. They were all taken up. I think the lesson is to probably over overbook it in the future and assume that some people won't come. I think it's where I started and why this event is so important, is having more events like this that become part of the, the, the sort of regular rhythm of the borough. And people say, I went along to that, I enjoyed it, I got the chance to ask a question and then look out for the next one. The more opportunities we have for doing this, the better. I don't think I'm underexposed on social media and in terms of advertising this event to younger people. So uh, I think it went out through the council's Twitter feed, it went out through mine, it went out through other councillors. I think it was well covered in both the Hackney Gazette and the Hackney Citizen. Uh, they've got journalists here, here tonight. Uh, there'll obviously be social media around asking me questions tomorrow and continuing that kind of... Uh, emphasis. Hackney Today is a rare thing and it's a controversial thing for some but actually having a council newspaper that goes through every door that promotes an event like this isn't available to most councils 
uh, whether or not people choose to sort of use it. We're looking at how we can build up a database of people on email, send more notices out through email. So if you're a council tenant or leaseholder, you can sign up to a tenant and leaseholder newsletter. I think you should write up a little and list, your of, ideas. That, a little list yeah. of ideas for improving and give it to him. Don't let him leave the building without shoving it in his pocket. Two people were well, hands up. One over here that fell in the green shirt. Again, if you can be quick so we can make sure we get everybody's yeah. uh, submitted question. Uh, my name's Alistair. I do quite a lot of work with the Hackney Green Party. And um, what my question was sort of related to the mental health issue and um, people worried about money. Um, evidence has shown that uh, cutting tax relief um, uh, re leads to more court cases, uh, use of bailiffs, rises in child poverty and things like that. And obviously the uh, sort of concurrent mental health issues that that might um, entail. And so I'm just wondering it, why Hackney is not following Camden's lead in um, sort of providing full council tax relief for its poorest residents. Okay, and let's, let's quickly have Pat's question and then some answers and then we'll move on to um, the next one. Well, I know a tenant who out of the blue got a letter saying that she owed £9,000 in overpaid welfare benefits and she's still She's trying to pay that off at a, an amount far above what she can actually afford to do, and she's still not got an answer as to how a £9,000 debt for a relatively poor person could be accrued without her ever being informed of it before. So I think when we're talking about mental health, we're talking about a lot of people in the borough who must be really suffering at the moment. Okay. So I've, I've sent that resident a clear answer to how that uh, occurred uh, only last week. So I hope they've now received it and that they can uh, absorb that. I don't want to go into the personal de details there. I think on the CTRS scheme, uh, the government passed over the responsibility but not the money. So uh, they used to have council tax benefit was held centrally, like housing benefit was the same system across the country. The government decided as part of austerity to pass that benefit over to councils and immediately cut 10% of, of the funding. Hackney has one of the highest levels of council tax benefit in the country, much, much higher than Camden. And Camden, because of that, has been able to take a decision that they'll still fully fund it. Uh, not taking into account that they're funded 10% less. And I think their caseload has been declining. Ours has declined a little bit, but we're very worried about universal credit. We want to make sure that there's a stable system in place. We've taken the political decision to take out care leavers, people that have uh, survived domestic abuse, and also people that have been involved in any kind of personal trauma tragedy in relation to their property. There's a consultation out at the moment I would encourage everyone to respond. There are some cliff edges of the types of people that are going to be affected by the changes that the council is proposing that I'm very keen to work through before we introduce the scheme. So I need residents to look at the scheme, take part in the consultation, and give us plenty of evidence to make that scheme better than the one we're currently consulting on. Uh, and that's my offer to residents. I don't want to prejudice the consultation uh, or the engagement of key stakeholders, but I want to listen to the results of that consultation and uh, make it better, because I know there's some cliff edges there that I think we can do better on. Thanks very much. I'm going to move straight on to the next question, because we've got to fit, fit these ones in. Uh, it's on Going Green, and is Filippo Piedi in the room, please? Looks like a no. <laughs> I'll ask the question, shall I? It should be in the council's interest to go as green as possible. The mayor might not know that a charity has presented a project to install solar panels and light up Stonebridge Park at virtually no cost to the council. This is supported by 150 resident signatures in the immediate area of the park. I would like to ask the mayor why the council has been so reluctant to discuss the project and why those 150 signatures have been completely ignored uh, well, I didn't know about this issue uh, until uh, a week or so ago. Okay. Uh, what I would say is that the council doesn't think it's at no cost to the council. It's not convinced that lighting up the park 24 hours a day will sort out antisocial behaviour uh, or make the park better. And that actually, mm -hmm. I'm not sure all the local residents want the park to be lit up in, in, in that way. So it comes back to that, how do you balance off a community that's petitioned Yep. with wider park users and wider people in the area and whether that's the right decision 
uh, for the park. I think I can't have a dialogue with the person because they're not in the room. I'm very happy to take it away as an issue. I think more broadly, we're really into community energy and grassroots community generation. Okay. We've got a, a very successful energy co-op on Bannister House. We're going to be coming to uh, the people of Hackney next year in our manifesto with some exciting ideas about community energy. That type of grassroots energy generation uh, is, is something that we really passionately believe in and I think is a really key part of making this borough sustainable and more self-sufficient and generating income uh, that can stay in the borough. Because ultimately, if you're not paying one of the big six uh, for the energy mm -hmm. and you're paying ourselves, essentially, that money can be invested in council services, community, uh, and, and, and the rest. So I, I passionately believe in it. I can't speak for this individual scheme. Okay. Anybody want to jump in on this particular theme? Yes, sir. Uh, council considered doing a consultation about that. I don't know. <laughs> happy to take that. Happy to take that away. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Straight answer for you there. Um, let's move on to question seven: car use and parking. Again, we've already touched on that one a bit. Celia Corum. Uh, good evening. With the sensible policy of dissuading car use in the borough th through things like controlled parking zones, why is the council encouraging parking for free on green space of Hackney Marshes when most of the users, I believe it's 64%, are from outside the borough. Is this not, in effect, a subsidy by local people? Thank you very much for that. Well, I think in terms of uh, the marshes, we've seen a decrease in the amount of parking spaces over the last 10 years. So we've gone from 600 to 252. So I think we are moving in the right direction in terms of the use of the marshes in a sustainable manner. We've got 160,000 people using them uh, a year and 252 parking spaces. So clearly most people that are going there are using public transport or are walking or cycling. My understanding is we've had a, a strategy in place for a year around the use of those spaces and are monitoring its outcomes. I think we need to talk to local residents, we need to talk to users of the marshes and check that that is working. The whole policy of the borough is to dissuade uh, car use and unnecessary local journeys and that can be controversial in itself and I'm sure there are those uh, that use the marshes that say there's not enough adequate car parking uh, spaces there. So it's how do you get that balance? A lot of the discussions this evening have been about balance and use of public space and use of public infrastructure uh, and how do you, how you make those choices obviously involves residents and ultimately then the council taking those different issues into account. Mm -hmm. And I do know that people you know, don't like CPZ, so they don't like car free developments, but we would not be able to live as a community without that investment in sustainable transport uh, and, and rationing parking space use. So I would say I think we've brought it down. Uh, if we could get to a place where we could return more of those parking spaces to green space, that would be fantastic. And that's going to be, over time, dissuading people from using those spaces. Um, but obviously there are the marshes users uh, as well. And it is the home of grassroots football and people do drive there. If we could get more of them onto their bikes, that would be fantastic. What do you think of that answer, Celia? Um, well, I'm, I'm sure that um, overall that's, that might be true. But I, I think specifically uh, people might not be aware of the new development that's going up on Hackney Marshes, which is away from the main sports centre, um, which is quite a difficult place for a car to get to anyway. Um, but I was at the planning committee last month where they were allocating uh, not only car spaces, minibus spaces, but also coach spaces. And any local resident uh, who uses the marshes, particularly in that area, will know that's not the best place to encourage traffic to run through the end of Billfields Road mm -hmm. over a very dangerous bridge um, onto green, uh, hitherto green space, okay. um, where the existing, the, the current sports centre on the other side of the marshes, a mere, it takes me a mere 15, 20 minutes to walk across and I'm not the youngest of people, um, you'd expect that space at the Hackney Centre could be encouraged in case, instead of building a new car park 
for um, people who maybe don't have mobility needs. Um, where obviously you've got to have some parking for mobility. Um, but I think most local people would say, well, if you go past Hackney Marshes Sports Centre, the majority of parking is at weekends, um, particularly Sundays. Okay. It's practically empty during the week. There's oh. very little use of it. Oh. So I think we need a better parking strategy uh, and a better encouragement people to use other forms of, of transport, maybe more drop-offs. Um, uh, and Quite difficult to get a football team across to the other side of London without having a minibus, I suppose. Well, as I think <laughs> <laughs> a minibus is obviously preferable to separate cars. There's no, no yep. getting away from that. But Cycling I think certainly, so. um, you know, I raised at the planning committee about the, the coach issue. Okay. Uh, and, you know, I'd like to challenge the mayor to go and coach over that bridge because uh, people still walk across it. And uh, it's right. very dangerous. Do you want to come back on that one? Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going to take away the issue. It's that, that specifics about the bridge I wasn't aware of. I'm probably not going to get in a coach and go over the bridge, but I will take away that issue and, and, and check what we're doing about it. Okay. I think the broad thing is about reducing car use in accessing sports facilities. Yes. And that's going to be controversial at the Britannia because there's a very big car park at the moment. Yes, I remember mm. parking in it. Does anybody just on this on this on this um, on this broader question of car use and controlling car use, which I've seen evolve gradually over the years? Anybody got any strong feelings about that? People get. This gentleman has. Yes. Yeah. And um, I'm actually not entitled to any parking at all. Sorry, I, did, I missed that. So I'm not entitled to any not parking entitled, yeah. at all. At all, and it's an issue that I've been fighting with the council for so long. For so long. Okay. We've, you, had, we've had a policy in place that all new development is car free. Can and I just cut you off for a second, then, please? Yeah. Um, I know there's, um, and I think it's an agreement that, that you make with the um, private builders, and they give you um, an exception to where you can build. They allow you to build there, and we, within that, you have like um, you won't have any um, parking at all there. And we had this issue for so many years, so many years. Is a car absolutely essential to what you do? It for is very essential to what I was doing because I was a delivery okay. driver. So wh how do you manage? I didn't. Oh right. What have you, what have you done instead then? What could I do? So no car, well, or, or you've had to park it miles away, or? We, I used to park um, in, um, what was the area called? Victoria. Okay, very um, inconvenient for you. Very inconvenient, So and it, it was my livelihood. This is, this, is, this is one of those very hot topics, isn't it? But so uh, defend, your, a, defend your policy. As a former Hoxton councillor, planning developments came forward to increase the housing in those areas. And one of the things that everyone that comes to planning committee would say is it's going to increase car use in that community and it's going to put stress on parking in that community. One of the ways we said to those communities before those homes were built that it wouldn't do that is by saying that development is car free. So that's why it's gone through planning and that's why we enforce it as a car free development because we made that commitment to the local community that we increase the number of people in this borough without increasing car use. So going back on that to the, you know, and I, I've, get, I've had the letters as well, people that are delivery drivers, taxi drivers, people that won't take new housing because it doesn't have car parking spaces. Mm -hmm. But in it, the level of growth that we, we've had in this borough and the level of need in terms of housing development if everyone was allowed a car, it would be totally congested. So and we're one of the few places in the country that's seen an increase in population and a decline in car use. Okay. So I'm afraid it's more car clubs, it's more use of cycling. If we can get to a point where we can think about who actually needs a car, and I do think business use needs to be thought about. Uh, if, if you are, you know, you need a car to do your job, whatever that job might be, I get very frustrated with that system because it's not flexible enough. But we will offer garage space on our housing estates to, to people, so there is that option. Basically, um, your problem is too many people. I'm sorry, 
<laughs> you need more car space. And and that's that's the only thing that I ask. That's why I came here today to meet you. And usually, I, I honestly don't come to this kind of event, but I did, and I had to, because I have to raise my concern and raise my voice. And my voice is, I'm just trying to provide. The only response is I can offer you a Hackney housing garage. Okay, I think you, but thanks, but thanks for your question. I, I, we've, it's now five to nine. We have got one more question. And some people disagree with that even because they say yeah, we're yeah. subverting the planning policy, but we, we, we have created a bit of flexibility around bringing our estates back into use in garages and meeting the needs of people that can't access Okay, I'm going to interrupt because I, yeah, I think you should have this conversation afterwards, yeah. okay? Because we've got one more question that was down and we, we, got, yeah, that's we fine. got five minutes. Okay, we'll make sure it happens, okay? Um, so They're running off, Dave. Uh, yeah, no, no, I'm going to be hanging around making sure you meet all these people you promised to meet. So uh, the, final, the final question on my list, I think, is about commercialization, commercialization of parks and green space. Uh, and we, the question here is from uh, pa Patrick um, McAvey. McAvey yep, my question that's it. Um, yeah, I'm going to kind of uh, be brief, because like, we've been talking about funding yeah. and revenue. Give us, and give us the question. You know, um, my, my question is, you know, in the in the light of um, the uh, corporate group Winterville withdrawing their application, and obviously they're going to go off and have a rethink and probably apply again in the future next year or something like that. Can the council assure that if they do allow uh, um, corporate groups to hire open green spaces and stuff like that in the borough? Will they make sure that they charge these people the market rates <laughs> for use of, the, of, of our parks? Okay. Will they also ensure that they pay for any clean-up and any damage to any green area in our parks? That's basically my question. Okay, very good question. So I go back, I start at the end of your question. Yes, towards restoring the park and cleaning up. That's fundamental to the use of our parks for any event. I think the market rate, what, you know, that's harder to define, but I want people to pay for the use of our parks because there's no point uh, in, in looking at more commercialisation in our parks if it's not generating an income. And I, I start from the point of view that we have 23 green flag parks here in Hackney, third largest number of green space uh, in inner London. They're incredibly important for a borough as dense as ours. And we only reluctantly look to commercialisation to generate income to support that service. It's not about wanting to do it for its own sake and it has to be done sensitively and I've lived with the consequences where we get that completely wrong uh, and I think we need to be more sensitive to the people that live near those parks when we talk about generating income. I also don't want to get to a point where we charge so much that they start to undermine and charge too much to access the event. So we want an event in our park if it is that type of event that is still accessible to local residents or offer free tickets to local residents and make sure that the jobs and income as well are shared by local residents. So there's quite a lot that I would want to see in a contract with, with our park. So yes, income maximisation, but you know how much are they charging, free tickets, engaging with local residents, hiring local people, paying London living wage, using local traders for concessions rather than just bringing people in outside. All those things get tied up in your question and I think deserve a good, uh, a good response and built into our policies. Can I come back on that? Yes, yeah. please do, yeah. Right, um, uh, the Winterville Corporation, the, the, they had their last uh, do, or whatever you want to call it, over in Victoria Park last year. Now, they want to use Haggerston Park because it's really near to the city, to all their corporate buddies. You know, so, for that, so they can have their office Christmas parties on Agerston Park. And this is what people are up in arms about because, like, it's not there to be uh, something for the local community or people that live in that area. It's for the corporate types to come and have their parties. That's what they've done last year. That's what they intended to do this year. And because people d uh, were on to them for that, they withdrew their application. Okay. You think it's, do you think it's overdone? Is that your problem? But, 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 but I think it's well overdone. There's, there's, okay. there's a, um, 
uh, I'm forgetting the word, but there's a conflict within your question now. You want to maximise income, but then you're saying that no, they're no, charging What I'm, what I'm saying is, is at some point we're going to have to compromise because there's all these cuts going on. There's, you know, lack of funding for different things like the lady over there was saying about youth services and stuff like that. Now, for us to keep services running, at some point we're going to have to compromise and use our facilities to bring in some revenue to keep these services running. Mm. Right, so if, we, if we're going to hire out our parks to corporate types, corporate event hosts and stuff like that, then obviously you know, we're going to have to bring in the maximum amount of revenue to keep other public services in their borough running. Okay, and that's a I problem. Think, I think, that's I think, a problem. I okay. think you've got to underpin that with values, though, and you don't want to get into position that Haringey have got into with wireless, where they're upsetting uh, Hackney, Islington, and their own residents because they feel that that balance just hasn't been struck. Now, Haringey can defend themselves uh, and, and do, and they put a case forward, but I don't want to get to a situation where we're maximising income so much that in a summer, all our parks are taken up with commercial events. We've been very clear in our events policy that's not we, what we want to see as well. Um, but I appreciate for the community we got it wrong uh, in this instance. Thank you. It is nine o'clock. We've got all the questions in. It's been great. I'd like to thank you very much for all coming and for answering your questions. I hope we've had some light and not too much heat. Okay, yeah. think about that one. Um, thank you. There are refreshments available downstairs in the foyer until 10 o'clock, so don't hang around. Would you like to just say a couple of things before we close? Just thank you very much for coming. If you didn't get a question asked, you can go on social media uh, uh, and ask it. Feedback, I think there's feedback forms about yes. what worked, what yeah. didn't. And there's Twitter questions you can put on Twitter and he'll answer them And tomorrow. both myself and my team will be around downstairs to take up any, any individual problems or follow up uh, as well. So we are all here. Uh, thank you. Okay. So you're going to give me your details. Which, this was, hang on, I'm not sure if that one... I remember oh. seeing that one earlier. <laughs> I'm going to turn my microphone off. I'm not sure if that one found its way in. I remember when you were running for me, I saw you, you know, my foot